Welcome to Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. Our team's goal is to present science-based information about gardening and all things nature in New York's Hudson Valley. Host Gene and Tim, along with team members Teresa and Linda, are master gardener volunteers for New York's Columbia and Greene counties. So if you're interested in gardening or nature or nuggets of information about what's happening outside your door, settle in. Enjoy the conversation. Whatever the season, we have something to say. I'm Tim Kennelty. And I'm Jean Thomas. And welcome to another episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. Today our guest is Rochelle Ashley from Stories Greenhouse. And she's going to be talking with us about holiday plants. Yeah, it's great. I didn't realize that there were plants for every holiday. See, this is, I obviously don't give gifts to people. Well, you should because Easter's coming. Even St. Patrick's Day has a gift, you know, a yeah. gift plant. And after we talk about a year's worth of holiday plants, we're not going to just stick to Easter. We're right, going, we're going to go through the whole calendar, right? Yeah, and then we're going trekking again with Heidi Bach. Excellent. Yeah, she's going to talk about the Harris Public Conservation Area in Austerlitz. It's a beautiful, really pristine place. Tim, what's a vernal pool? Basically, it's a pool that is there in the spring. It dries up in the summer, and they're really, really important in terms of frogs and amphibians and things like that. I went for a walk one day, and there was a, it sounded like there were a million geese. Yeah. And it was a little pond, and it had frogs in it. Yes, my pond, actually, I have a small pond at my house, and it sounds like quacking ducks. I ran out there the other day, but it's wood frogs. And the decibel level was incredible. Yeah, so that's going to be great to listen to. And if you want to hear wood frogs, Harris Conservation Area is the place to go. What else? Oh, we've got your It's All Greek to Me, don't we, Gene? Yeah, we're talking about color. It's really interesting because a lot of Latin plant names are really descriptive and do include colors. And you can play with the names like Acer rubrum. You know, it's the ruby-colored Acer, which is a maple. I think that's going to be a really interesting one to listen to, too. I can't wait. And also, one of the things we wanted to mention today is we have a new Instagram account. Follow us on Instagram at Nature Calls Hudson Valley. We've got a bunch of followers. And I talk about episodes that are coming up and put a lot of nice pictures of beautiful plants on it. And now that we're in a few episodes, we really want to get feedback from our listeners. We want to hear from them. We want to hear what they think and also if they have ideas for episodes and interviews and if they have Master Gardener questions. So you can email us at columbiagreenmgv at cornell.edu. So let's listen in to Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. Our guest today is Rochelle Ashley from Stories Nursery in Freehold a destination nursery for over 50 years. She's had 40 (laughs) years of experience in the plant industry, and she's seen many little plants go out in the world to an unknown fate. Okay, let's start with the easy stuff. What do you do when someone gets a dish garden or a token plant, usually a piece of ivy from a bridal shower or wedding, or you can't resist that herb plant in the produce department of the supermarket? Well, the first thing you should do when you get a plant is I would inspect it to make sure it doesn't have any type of insects. Spider mites are one of the hardest ones to see. Uh, they look kind of look like dust on the bottom, but there's there's ones that are obvious like aphids and mealybugs, but I just make sure it's pretty healthy. Uh, then you want to put it in some fresh soil, put it in a bright indirect light window, and you're good to go. If you have a dish garden, uh, they, they're they okay for probably maybe one season, and then eventually you're going to have to separate all those little plants and give them all their own space. Okay, that sounds straightforward enough. Let's get into the scary stuff. How about if we travel through a year of holidays? About the first holiday in the year is Valentine's Day. We get more cut flowers with this one. Are there particular practices we should use to make them last longer? 
The worst enemy of cut flowers is bacteria in the water. So if you take your flowers out of the watering vase and make sure you clean that every couple of days and put fresh water in there and a little bit of, of the packet that they give you, the flower preserver, you'll last a little bit longer. Huh, that's really interesting. We also see lots of um, African violets and cyclamen and miniature roses. How do I deal with those without having them die immediately? Well, all three of those have totally different requirements. African violets there, they want to be out of direct light, out of cold drafts. You don't want to water the plant, the leaves. You want to water them from the bottom. They're one of the hardier ones, I'd say. They're going to hang around a little bit longer, maybe not the flowers. Cyclamen, cyclamen like to be cool. Uh, so if you have a nice cool area to put them in, they, they like bright indirect light. And one of the biggest mistakes people make with them is they overwater them. They're a little bit more succulent leaves, so they retain their water a little bit longer. They like to be a little bit more on the dry side. And miniature roses, lots of the miniature roses are hardy. If you can keep them alive until you can plant them outdoors, they're perfectly safe to put them in the ground and they're perfectly hardy. Spider mites are usually a big deal with those and improper watering. Lots of times they're grown as a gift plant. They put them in a very poor soil when you get them. They're grown in basically straight peat moss. So the plant will dry out and, and the leaves kind of tend to brown up. They do live forever once you get them into the garden. And they do like full sun. So yeah. they wanted one of those plants that like a lot of sun. All right, St. Patrick's Day, those cute little shamrocks, which are actually oxalis, what can you do with them? How long do they survive? And what about the green carnations? Well, green carnations are dyed. They put those in, in a dye to make them green. Uh, the oxalis, I know they do go through a dormant period. I want to say it's during the heat of the summer when they go into a dormancy period. Uh, and then you can just let the, they're like little rhizomes or bulbs in there, and you want to just let them rest and then take them out again when it's a little bit cooler and, and water them and give them some fertilizer. So they need like a rest period, do they? Or or no, they have like carrot little rhizomes. Right? Yeah, I, I believe they do need a rest period. Uh -huh. And cyclamen are the same way. Lots of times in the heat of the summer, the cyclamen will start turning yellow and they'll die back. And if you just let it die back naturally, put it in a dark place for the summer in the hottest time of the year, then bring that plant out that has a little corm in there. Bring that out and start giving it some water and fertilizer. They'll rejuvenate. Yeah, I think I've had like surprise mm -hmm. uh, spurts of growth <laughs> from those. What about Easter plants? Everybody buys their mom an Easter plant. Tell us about like some of the good Easter plants, some of the ones that will last for a while too. Easter plants, it's my worst holiday in the plant world <laughs> because there's so many different crops, so many different conditions. Uh, lots of times people do bulbs, tulips, daffodils, they're nice because once you're done with the bulbs, you let the plant die back naturally. You put it in the garden, and you've got years of, of enjoyment out of it. So you really can take those bulbs that were forced and put them in the garden? Yes, and, yes. And just, oh, yeah, they'll let solid. them die back I think naturally. I threw those out. <laughs> uh, Easter lilies, uh, they're also hardy to our zone as well for a few years. They usually bloom in August, but you let the plant die naturally and then plant it outdoors in your garden, and you'll get a couple good years of, uh, of flowering out of it. Uh, some of the not-so-popular ones, everybody comes in and purchases the hydrangeas, the big blue-flowered or the pink-flowered. In our area, they're not hardy at all. Uh, they're, they're for southern, so they're probably, I just consider them a gift plant. Another plant that is pretty much just a gift plant is thinner areas, or they're also, they have one, it's like, kind of like a hybrid, I believe. It's called Sinetti. We've had them at the nursery. Again, it's it's basically a gift plant, and uh, it's an annual. Once it's done blooming, uh, the, heat of the heat of the season comes, and it usually expires by then. Most people like the uh, lilies because they're not just white Easter lilies. There's the Mona Lisa's, the stargazers. We have pink lilies, uh, orange pot lilies, uh, and all those are great because they can, again, be put out in the garden when you're done. And when you do put them out, you probably want to put them out someplace where the deer can't eat them, right? Because, yeah, I would think so. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I would think so, yes. Yeah, yeah deer <laughs> yeah, love them. Yeah, they yeah. do like the lilies. Yeah. Okay, so now you mentioned a couple of the <clears throat> throwaway plants mm -hmm. that aren't really worth all the work. Did you talk about calcellaria, pocketbook plants? Calcellaria, that's an old timer. I know. I, I, I haven't seen them in years. Oh. Uh, and they're, again, like you said, they were a gift plant. Uh, they bloom beautifully when it's cool, and then pretty much when it's done, it's, it's done. 
Okay, and what about the Easter egg eggplants and chrysanthemums? Chrysanthemums, they're the ones you get at Easter time are usually greenhouse grown and they're not hardy garden mums. So again, once they're done blooming, they're done. They, you, you won't get those to uh, come back every year. Is that true with, I know you talked about how the hydrangeas were not to our zone. What about azaleas when you get those as gift plants? Most of the azaleas that are available Easter time are, again, uh, annuals. They're not hardy in our area. Occasionally, you can pick up a hardy azalea that's been forced into bloom earlier. Uh, if you're looking to continue on, that, that would be my best bet. But most of the most of them that you're going to see available are are just annuals. And you couldn't keep that as a house plant year over yes, year? Yes, I, I believe you I could. Think. I believe you could. The foliage one might, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, as a foliage plant. So what about Mother's Day plants? Mothers who garden have usually made their wishes very, very clear and already posted a list on the fridge. I think my mother used to do that, but it was probably for jewelry, not Mother's Day plants. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about Mother's Day plants and what's really popular. Mother's Day, everything is popular. Mm-hmm. It is the busiest weekend that we have all year. It's, uh, I guess it would be the equivalency to, I call it Hell Week. <laughs> <laughs> Hell Week, Mother's Day. I like well, they, that. They do. They bring the families along. Oh, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's a whole thing. Yeah, and then people like to bring mom in and pick out her plants, which is nice, but a lot of them are not real happy about it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, there's uh, anything goes Mother's Day. Hanging baskets, because now you're talking you're in the middle of May, so things that can be put outside a little bit early, hanging baskets trees and shrubs. We do a lot of uh, little container gardens with annuals in it that can be put out on the deck or on the porch. One of the biggest ones that people love are the fuchsia hanging baskets because they're so beautiful. Uh, Lots of times azaleas are blooming then and the uh, rhododendrons, so they, they also make a nice gift. So you have more of a chance of those having a little bit of longevity during the year because you're, you're at the beginning of the season. Yes, yep. Mm-hmm. And I do have a complaint about those fuchsia hanging plants. You need to grow more. <laughs> I always get there late. It's one of those plants, they're very tender, so they don't like to be outside, and they're, they like, set, like 60, 70 degree evenings. And by the time it's that time to put them out, we're, we're way sold out, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so you know, you know that I get there late. Try to save me some. <laughs> and we, we actually get our fuchsias from a Canadian grower. So their season is a lot later than ours. So lots of times by the time Mother's Day comes, he's not ready for them yet because the, he grow, they're grown in Canada. So there's something that sometimes is available more towards mid-end of May than they are at the beginning of May. I have to beg him to get some for Mother's Day because they're just not ready. Give me his number. (laughs) And and are there Father's Day plants? I mean, I know there's gardening seems to be something that is catching on with men. There are not a lot of men master gardeners, but are there Father's Day plants? Most I'd say of the plants purchased for Father's Day, most it's vegetable plants. A lot of people come in for vegetable gardening because it is in June. Trees and shrubs, fruit trees are big for Father's Day. Everybody comes in and wants to get the fruit trees for Dad. Yeah, I'd, I'd say the mostly. We have a lot of male, male gardeners. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. They should become master gardeners, right? Are there some really hot, like, fruit trees? Are there, are, like, are there some that are really, like, Asian pears? Or is there something that's really hot right now? All of it. All of it. Okay. Yeah, we have sold more fruit trees and fruiting plants in the past two years. I mean, it was on the upswing to begin with before the pandemic. But as soon as the pandemic hit, they want to grow their own food. They want to have the security and they want to have something to do as well. But uh, there's a big swing towards growing your own food and vegetable plants. I've been in the, in the business for 40 years. And when I first started, vegetable gardening was big. And we grew tons of tomatoes, and every year it just dwindled and dwindled and dwindled to the point where our vegetable section got to be just like tomato plants, peppers, and and now people are wanting the more unusual. They are, you know, they come in there like, wow, you have celeriac. Nobody grows celeriac, so we have some interesting things to to contribute. Do, do you have to kind of manage expectations as far as fruit trees? Because I mean, I've 
grown fruit trees. And the first year, you don't get a lot of fruit usually, right? You don't get a lot of fruit for quite a few right. years. It's something that you're planning for the future, like four or five years down the road. Uh, so, yeah, you, you do have to kind of have a little bit of patience with it. And do you have irate customers coming in saying, where's my fruit? Mm, not no. not okay, normally. No. <laughs> More like, where are your fruit trees? Last right. year, we were sold out uh, really, really early in the season. So... Blueberries and, and, and bush berries and things like that, too, raspberries, mm -hmm. are they still popular yes, as well? Yes, yeah. Blueberries are one of the easiest fruiting plants to grow. They don't have too many pests, and they're pretty reliable. A lot of acid in the soil, yes. though, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, how about the fall? We got Columbus Day and Halloween and things like that. You're not going to want indoor things, but do you have certain seasonal demand there? Well, fall is mostly all about mums, flower and kale, flower and cabbage, ornamental grasses are another one that's popular. Are you more likely to get the perennial mums then? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. Okay. so that's a difference. And so I'm on to Thanksgiving now because I'm thinking about eating turkey because we're always Food. thinking about eating here, right? Is Are there plants? I, I, I would be still planting bulbs probably at Thanksgiving, but what, are there Thanksgiving plants or is it mostly cut flowers or kind of what's the what's the thing that's happening thanksgiving. thanksgiving there's really not that much occasionally we'll have somebody looking for flour and kale or cabbage uh still available but that's about it that time of year yeah, it's pretty late in the season so you're mostly into the tabletop yes then you're into table arrangements yeah okay i guess it's time to move on to the greatest of all plant holidays christmas or whichever of the many holidays you might be celebrating at this time of year What's the number one Christmas plant, Rochelle? Oh, definitely the poinsettia. Mm -hmm. Let's let's hear about the the colors that you can get in poinsettias now. There's a lot of uh, new varieties and colors. It's kind of hard to keep up with. Uh, there's just the basic red, white, the marble. That was the big thing when that first came out. Pink is another variety. Now they've got all different ones. The newest one is one that's the princetias. They're kind of like a little miniature poinsettia flower, and they come in really neon pink and bright colors, uh, hot pink, dark pink. There's some with like pink with a splash of red on them. Uh, there's the Jingle Bells variety from back in the day, which were which were red with some white splotches on them. So there's a lot of uh, breeding going on with those. They're always offering new varieties. And do I want to keep those away from my cats and dogs? Are they Poisonous, poinsettias? They're poisonous, but in order for your animal to be harmed by it, he'd have to eat like half the plant or more. More or so, they have a very milky sap, and if they were to chew on that, it's probably not going to taste good, and right. it's probably going to give them some discomfort in their mouth. So the chances of them eating enough that's going to make them sick is pretty slim. And then do I need to do something like crazy with poinsettias, like put them in a closet or something i remember doing something like in that. in my opinion a poinsettia is a gift plant and you enjoy it for the holiday and you throw it away but there are those people that want to keep it from year to year and they want to know how how to get it to rebloom it's, it's not a hard thing to do it just takes a lot of patience and you have to be attentive to it you would treat it as a regular plant I'd say probably around uh, July or August, you would give it a good cut back so that it promotes some new branching and uh, is a little stockier because they tend to grow like a vine. And then I'd say probably right around the beginning of October, you want to trick the plant into thinking that the days are getting shorter, quicker than they actually are. And about every day at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, you need to put that plant in total darkness uh, and then take it out of the total darkness in the morning every day oh. until it initiates. So it is a lot of work. <laughs> Once it initiates into start to flower, uh, then you can just bring it out and it doesn't have to have the, but it's just to get it to initiate into uh, blooming. Or you could drive up to Story's Nursery and buy your next point. Sorry. Exactly. <laughs> So what are some of the other Christmas plants, traditional plants, well, and, and new plants? That cyclamens you're... are very popular because it's a cool time of year, and they, do, and they do well. Amaryllis bulbs are very popular. They usually come in, I would say, September, October. 
and they're by the time we get them in from our supplier, they're almost it's almost too late to start growing them. Uh, they need a good six to ten weeks for them to bloom. So the popularity in, in them is not giving it to somebody as an already flowering plant. It's giving to them as a bulb, if something for them to grow for the winter. Uh, like I said, they need a, a good six to ten weeks, and they need a, a really warm start. Uh, so we sometimes start them and we'll put them in our furnace room to get them warmed up because we keep our greenhouses rather cool in the winter time. And, and you can grow those year over year too, can't you? Yes. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a, there's method. I know my sister does it, and she has many, many, many of them, and she just has every year she has them blooming. Yep, and you, they're they're another plant that needs a little bit of a rest period where you have to let the the plant rest and die back, and you cut the tops off, put it someplace where it's nice and cool and dark, and then take it out, fertilize it, and or go drive up to Story's Nursery and buy a new amaryllis plant, right? Yeah. That's the only way. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, way. for me. Anyway. I do have a poinsettia that I keep over year, year to year. I keep it as a house plant in the winter. Plant it in the ground for the, so then I get to see it at its natural time because it will color up then. Mm -hmm. And then I just dig it back up and stick it in a pot and put it back in and try again. And if it doesn't make it over a winter, it becomes compost. <laughs> compost is a good thing it for those suicidal thing. plants. It is a good thing. Yeah. And the Christmas cactuses are also popular. And uh, a lot of people say, why aren't my Christmas cactus blooming? One of the main reasons is they do need a, they need a long night, like a 14-hour night. So when the days get short and they need a cool period, so I usually tell people if they put their plant outside and just let it be natural outside and don't be so quick to bring it in in the fall, leave it out there. Let it experience some 50, 45 degree nights and that will give it a little bit of a cold period with the long nights and that should initiate it to start blooming. It, it can't take frost though, can it? I no, mean, like it can, I mean frost. it won't. a frost won't kill it, but it's not going to do it any good. But if you can let it you know, cool down to be you know, 50, 48 degrees, that's fine. If you have a, a house, a room in your house that's a little bit cooler that you might not heat, you can put it in there. Like an unheated basement. Or exactly, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, wow, thanks for visiting us, Rochelle. We'll make sure the transcript for this podcast is on the website ASAP. Might just save some lives, some plant lives at least. Thanks again. Thanks for having me. Thank you. You're listening to Nature Calls, conversations from the Hudson Valley. Stay tuned for Trekking the Trails. Welcome back to Trekking the Trails. I'm Heidi Bach with the Columbia Land Conservancy. And this month, we'll be visiting Harris Conservation Area a 76-acre property on Stonewall Road in Austerlitz. This site has nearly two miles of trails that take you through hemlock forests, near rocky cliffs, and a number of streams and wetlands. For this trek, we'll walk along the Salamander Loop, which takes us through a hemlock and mixed hardwood pine forest. Depending on the weather, if you head out on the trails this month, you may notice the trails to either be snow-covered or quite muddy, so you'll want to plan accordingly. Harris is an excellent place for watching wildlife and snowshoeing or cross-country skiing in the winter. If snow hasn't melted, you may see lots of animal tracks, which is a great way to learn what critters are living in the woods around us. There are a lot of great resources on how to identify tracks, and we'll link to some in the show notes. The most common tracks you will see here at Harris are deer, raccoon, porcupine, fox, and squirrels. If there's been a warm spell, you will want to look and listen for the critters of woodland pools also known as vernal pools. These temporary small bodies of water start to fill up from the winter snowmelt in early spring. They support an important array of aquatic life, including wood frogs and mole salamanders, that need these special wetlands to survive. As you walk along, you may hear what sounds like ducks quacking, but in fact, these are male wood frogs inviting females to come to the pond to breed. Wood frogs are the mascot for Harris, and are a medium-sized brown or tan frog with a dark mask around their eyes. Spotted salamanders, on the other hand, don't make any noise, but are quite impressive when you find one. They have black, chubby bodies with uneven rows of yellowish-orange spots. Both of these species travel to woodland pools to mate and lay eggs, which will grow in the pool over a few months in the spring. 
Harris is an important piece of the puzzle for these critters. They only use the woodland pools for a short time in the spring, then head out to the woods to spend the rest of their lives. Unfortunately for many of these frogs and salamanders throughout the region, they often have to cross well-traveled roads to get to their breeding pools. You can help them by staying home on warm, rainy spring nights, or if you want to become a volunteer with the Amphibian Migration and Road Crossing Project, we help folks get out to areas where there are high concentrations of migrating critters to help them on their journey to the woodlands pools. We will put a link to that in the show notes for this project. For more than 30 years, the Columbia Land Conservancy has worked to inspire our community to more deeply connect with, respect, and protect the natural world. We collaborate with partners and volunteers to improve the health of the land, ensure a thriving farm economy, create environmental education opportunities, provide access to outdoor experiences, and support municipal leaders in conservation-minded decision-making. To learn more, visit cLCtrust.org or find us on Facebook and Instagram. You're listening to Nature Calls, conversations from the Hudson Valley. Stay tuned for It's All Greek to Me. This is another segment of It's All Greek to Me, a look at the world of Latin, jargon, and acronyms in gardening. I've been thinking a lot about color lately. I'm designing a garden, and I want the shrubs to have more interesting things going on than just green leaves. There are many shrubs with colorful foliage, and I'm learning how the botanical names are descriptive. Let's start with the most obvious. We all know there are red maples. Acer rubrum means red maple, but this maple only turns red in the fall. Sometimes there's a red tint to new leaves, but that's the extent of it. If you're looking for a maple that stays red the whole growing season, you can choose the equally famous Japanese maple, Acer palmatum. The word palmatum is from the root word for palm, a description of the leaf being shaped like a hand. No mention of color in the botanical name at all. Go figure. However, most often the variety name can be descriptive, as in Acer palmatum atropurpureum, blood good, which is a deep purple red. The word atropurpureum breaks down into atro, a form of the Latin ater, meaning black, and purpura, or literally, black purple. Red has lots of names in the plant world. Phaseolus, a Latin name for cow peas, adopted by Linnaeus for all related domestic beans, plus cochinea, reputedly from the Greek caca for red, is known in English as scarlet runner bean. Another red is indicated by the word punicius. This word is connected to the color red by a convoluted historical trail, leading back to the ancient Phoenicians, a.k.a. the Punic people, a.k.a. the Purple people, because they traded in the dyes that made the then rare purple-red dyes that made this color. So there's an aster, formerly known as Aster punicius, native to the eastern part of the U.S., and named after its reddish-purple stems. Here's where things get sticky. The scientists recategorized it from the Acer genus to the Symphotrichum genus, so now it's Symphotrichum punicius. What happened here is a result of DNA research by botanists. They found that most North American native asters aren't related to the European and Asian asters, so the New World asters got shuffled into a different genus. This was done so recently that most of us didn't even know about it, so we're in on a plant world scoop. I'm not sure how much I like it, though. I'm still a bit peeved from when they changed the Brontosaurus, a perfectly good name, to Apatosaurus. But that's progress. You can't please everyone, dinosaurs or not. Let's try for yellow. Aurium means golden, so if you look at a plant name that includes aurium, that's a clue that there will be yellow coloring in the leaf, stem, or flower. Lysimachia numularia aurium, for example. Lysimachia is from the core words lysis, release from, and mache, strife. 
Nomalaria is from the core small coin, and aurium from the core word for gold. So the common name for the whole genus is loosestrife, an uncommon literal translation of the genus name. And this particular one is describing the small golden coin-shaped flowers. The plant is commonly called moneywort or creeping jenny. Another hint that there will be yellow coloring is the descriptive lutea, from the core Latin word lutum, a weed used in dyeing things yellow. The more you peek behind the curtain of etymology, the study of the origin of words, the more often you'll find redundancy. Plants are often described as similar to another kind of plant or referring to a geographic location or a person's name. So binomial nomenclature could probably be a good deal more precise, but what fun would that be? How about white? Lots of plants have white flowers, and many gardeners are partial to the idea of an all-white garden. The easiest way to find a clue that a plant has white flowers or foliage is to look for the term albus, or alba, somewhere in the formal Latinized name. If you grow roses, you already know about this. Roses often carry the name alba for their white flowering varieties and hybrids. Salix, willow, alba, white, is the white willow shrub. Pretty straightforward, huh? The name translates directly in English to white willow. This refers to the fact that the underside of the leaves appears to be white. Another mouthful that's easy to interpret if you speak Greek is the common Leucanthemum vulgare. This is the familiar oxide daisy that grows wild just about everywhere. Leucanthemum breaks down into luke, white, and anthemon, flower. Then we switch from the Greek to Latin, vulgare, which means common or vulgar. So here we have the common white flower a.k.a. daisy. We'll look at some other color-oriented terminology next time. That concludes another episode of Nature Calls, conversations from the Hudson Valley. We would like to thank Sandra Linnell and Devin Connolly from Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties for production support. And a special thank you to our listeners for joining us on this episode of Nature Calls, conversations from the Hudson Valley. You can find links to any of the topics mentioned in this episode at our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org. Comments and suggestions for future topics may be directed to us at Columbia Green MGB at Cornell.edu or on the CCE Master Gardener Volunteers of Columbia and Green County's Facebook page. For more information about Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties, visit our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org or visit us in Hudson or in Acre. Cornell Cooperative Extension provides equal programming and employment opportunities 